Well, this weekend, we don't have a special guest. Uh, we have Straight Up Family preaching this weekend. Yeah. My best friend on planet Earth and twin, fraternal twin, uh, Tim Ross, is here this weekend. And you've heard me talk about this before. Remember, we're, we're like 10 weeks in as a church. I know we did 10 year, a 10-year tour before that. Uh, but we're 10 weeks into Pillar Church, and this is something that Timmy and I have talked about and dreamt about for a decade and a half plus. Uh, because remember, Gateway Scottsdale was the church I started in Scottsdale, but Pillar was the church I was meant to die pastoring in Scottsdale. And so we're only 10 weeks in to that church, and I've told you before, th this is war. Building the kingdom is, is battle. And one of my favorite things about my twin is he knows the fight that I and we are in spiritually. And one of the most special things on the planet is that my best friend, with all the things going on in his world right now, which are blowing up, uh, I know you know him as The Basement's Tim Ross. <laughs> but to me, he'll always be Timmy. And one of my favorite things is even with everything going on in his world, that he would take the time to hit the pause button throughout this year and to come help us fight in this battle because he has access to as much spiritual gunpowder as anybody in my life. So I want you to welcome for the very first time to Pillar Church, my twin, Tim Ross. That was good enough for me, people. Let's give it up for our King of King and our Lord of Lord, Jesus Christ. Can we do that real quick? Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Hey, y'all. I love you. It's so good to see you. I'm so grateful to be here with you all. This is my first time being at Pillar Church, uh, and I'm so excited about what God is doing here. And I'm, I'm just excited to serve. Uh, Prez and I are uh, fraternal twins. He's taller. I have more hair. <laughs> and uh, I love to fight. It's just a little, I come, I, I, I was born and raised in Inglewood, California. I'm a small frame, but when you fight, you don't fight fair. When somebody is considerably taller than you and they outweigh you, you get objects. <laughs> you use these objects to your advantage. But spiritually, scripture is clear that if one can chase a thousand, two can chase 10,000. And when you multiply that by the people in this room, the enemy has nowhere to hide in this city in this region, in this entire state. So we have the advantage. Uh, I'm on assignment today. I feel like um, the message that God has given me uh, is going to benefit you for the rest of your life. Notice I did not say it was a life-changing message. You know, a lot of preachers think every message they have is life-changing, epic, awesome stupendous. No one's batting a thousand like that. This is going to be a good message, and I think it's going to change your thoughts and your mind for the rest of your life. If you have your Bibles, uh, I want you to go to the book of Philippians chapter number four. I want to read a few verses to you, and then I give you the title of the message. I'll pray, and then we'll go. Is that all right? I'm reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible, and um, that's that. I've been reading uh, NLT. Prez is the one that put me on to NLT back in 2008. I was reading King James to young adults, and that was painful. <laughs> I love the King James. I have all my scriptures memorized in King James. But quite honestly, reading King James is like off-roading in a Honda Civic. It's just it's quite painful. So um, NLT just smooths out some wrinkles. There's some things in NLT that don't hit the same as 
that good old uh, King's English, but we're just going to have to go with it. Uh, Philippians chapter number four, starting at the fourth verse, Paul writes this, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Quite honestly, ooh, if this was my message for this weekend, I could really camp right there because there's a lot of us that pray to God for what we need, but we never remind him and ourselves of what he has done. So don't pray with amnesia. Like he's not going to come through in this situation like he's come through in every previous situation you've been through. He says, thank God, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. I want you to pay close attention to the eighth verse. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one Final thing, fix your thoughts. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Three words, very simple, fix your thoughts. Would you say that with me? Fix your thoughts. One more time, a little bit louder. Fix your thoughts. One more time, real loud. Fix your thoughts. Let's pray, shall we? Holy Spirit, fix our thoughts. Amen. I pray quick. I'm the one you went over for Thanksgiving dinner. We will eat it while it's hot. I know I've offended all the intercessors. Y'all are still praying like that was not enough. Uh, The book of Philippians is uh, one of... Paul's shorter letters uh, to a church. Uh, It does not have the theological density of Romans. It does not have uh, the corrective tone of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Um, It's a very uplifting, swift, inspirational letter uh, to a community of believers in Philippi. What makes it uh, incredible to me Uh, is the dichotomy uh, that you find in the words that Paul pins based on where he was at the time. The book of Philippians is one of Paul's prison letters. He was not on a beach with some shorts on, under an umbrella, with a drink that had an umbrella in it, feet crossed, casually allowing the cool sea breeze to waft through his hair and beard, chilling on the side, pontificating about how good life is and how good God is as he pins this letter. Paul, the apostle, is behind prison walls, putting pen to parchment, to write to a community of believers, and the only thing he has is encouraging words, uplifting words. This should calibrate our thinking when we consider where we are and what we're going through right now. Paul is telling people that it's going to be okay, that you can be content in whatever situation that you are in, that You should be somebody that is shouting from the mountaintops 
that you've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And he's doing all of this behind prison walls. How happy can you communicate when you're in a prison? Consider the last seven days of your life and some of the text messages you've sent out for some of the inconveniences you have been exposed to. And imagine now being behind prison walls and you put pen to paper and the words are not, please help. <laughs> it's so hard out here. Pray, saints. Don't do short prayers like Tim. <laughs> Intercede, man. Give me a better defense lawyer, man. I'm locked up. He is behind bars encouraging people. And when somebody's behind bars writing you and telling you that you can rejoice, I think you better rejoice. Now, it would be one thing if uh, Paul's behind bars and he is writing to a community uh, that is experiencing freedom and joy and bliss. It's not a letter to Scottsdale. Baby Dubai. This is a letter to Philippi. Paul, who was behind prison walls, literally putting pen to parchment to uplift a community of believers who are being persecuted for their faith. It's easy to tell people that are already in happy circumstances to be happy. It's another thing to tell people that are being persecuted, rejoice. I know you're under some duress right now, but tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Imagine reading this letter, being persecuted for what you believe, not casually strolling in, from the comfort of your house to worship the Lord like we all did today. But getting up three hours early and driving in circles to make sure that you're not being trailed. To park underground. To get to a place where you can worship the Lord, but maybe not too loud, not because you're ashamed but because you might be arrested. Rejoice under those circumstances. Pray, ask God what you need under those circumstances, but thank him for what he has done under those circumstances. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, I guarantee you, even being persecuted, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. If this is all Paul wrote, it would have been enough. And then this dude says, but one final thing. After all the encouragement that I could give you, I got one final thing I need you to do. Fix your thoughts. If Paul would have just left it right there, I think it would have been enough, but he goes on to kind of cascade in a way what he wants you to think about. And he says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. One final thing, fix your thoughts. So I simply wanna remind you of what he asked us to fix our thoughts on. Sometimes it is the reminders that keep us from having blinders on how we need to see and view life. And I imagine without having a word of knowledge or any prophetic inclination that our thoughts are bombarded 
all day and all night with all types of things. And so Paul says, you need to be very, very mindful about what's living in your head. Rent free for no reason. Number one, he says, fix your thoughts on things that are true. Woo! I'm so grateful he said this. Because we live in a day and age right now, ladies and gentlemen, where everybody thinks they know what truth is. We live in a day and age right now, ladies and gentlemen, where everybody thinks their truth is the truth. I'm speaking my truth. No, it's not. That's not true. That's your opinion. It's my truth. It's true to me. And you will respect my truth. I, I don't have to. No, I don't have to respect your truth. I do respect the truth. And I just happen to know what the truth is. It is not a doctrine. It is not a denomination. It is not a theological ideology. It is a person. And his name is Jesus. He is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. He's the truth. So when scripture says, fix your mind on the truth, things that are true, it starts with a person. You can tell me what you think your truth is. I'm going to line it up against the man who is the truth. And after I make my comparative analysis, I'm going to let you know if what you're saying is the truth. Here's my truth, blah, and I take it to the man, and I'm like, mmm, Yeshua doesn't think that's the truth. I can't tell you how many things I've been wrong on when I line it up in front of who is literally the embodiment of truth. Fix your mind on Jesus. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. If he would have stopped there, it would have been fantastic. He goes on. Fix your thoughts on things that are honorable and right. Ooh, this should blow up a bunch of people's feed on social media. If we're gonna fix our thoughts on things that are honorable and right, it simply means that I don't want to look at things that are dishonorable and wrong. I don't want things in my mind that bring dishonor to God and discomfort to me. Just because people put it out doesn't mean I have to consume it. I have successfully broken the algorithm on Instagram explore page. I'm so proud of myself. Only uh, people in this room of a certain age and stage will be able to appreciate this. Uh, but uh, the Explore page on Instagram can be highly ratchet. It can be absolutely inappropriate and bring you things that you never wanted to, do, to see or never wanted to entertain. And you're like, oh my goodness, how'd this pop up? And then you're looking around like, oh Jesus, I hope nobody saw this. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you how you can successfully change the algorithm of your explore page. They have a little, a little button that if you hold down on the thing that you don't like, a little icon will pop up to say not interested. And you push that button and you never see anything like that again. After four and a half months of doing this, <laughs> I told you the algorithm was ratchet and it wants you to see dishonorable and wrong things. So after four and a half months of playing whack-a-mole with this explore page, the only thing that pops up now is basketball and butterflies. It is the, it is the most beautiful explore page you've ever seen in your life. I can put it up on the screens right now and just scroll incessantly. And the only thing that will come up is slam dunks, three-pointers, and butterflies. It is beautiful. 
Why? I don't want anything in my space that is dishonorable and downright wrong. They show up in my prayer time, man. When I'm trying to worship, some meme pops up and I'm like, why is this in my head right now? Because I've allowed things into my mind that I don't want to see. I don't know about you, but it can be hard to shake certain images, sounds, sayings, scenes. So we don't want to look at anything that's dishonorable and wrong. Fix your thoughts on things that are honorable and right. Next thing he says, which I love, is fix your thoughts on things that are pure, lovely, and admirable. Moral purity, beautiful, attractive things. That I, I, I love being stimulated and, and, and um, uh, wowed by nature, creation. I, I love time alone. I'm an introvert, and so I recharge when I am alone. When I get to be around things that are pure and lovely, you get to admire things and be wowed by God in ways that are just beautiful, sweet, and innocent. Why is this so important, especially right now in our culture? Because there's a lot of impure things. And a lot of things that are really not attractive that we're being told is attractive. And if you don't know the difference, it can get really, really cloudy very, very quickly. I love nature. It's beautiful. I love being in the mountains. I love, I just love being alone. Anywhere I could be alone. Did I say I like being alone? I'm an introvert. Introverts don't mean that you don't like people. It just means that people drain you. And you need time to recharge alone. Y'all are draining me right now. <laughs> Y'all look so sweet and you're, you're not even, you're like, I'm not even doing anything. It's just, it's me. It's not you. It's clearly me. But when I'm alone, I, I, I just get to behold beauty in a, in, in a way and, and interact with nature in a way. But I, I don't want to have thoughts that are impure. I don't want to have thoughts that cloud me. I don't want to have thoughts that bring me down. We have too many cynical Christians. We have too many believers that can't see the beauty in things because they've trained their minds to only see the bad in things. Ooh, okay, Holy Spirit. Some of y'all need to cut off the news. I heard that real clear. I don't know who that's for, but that news cycle is not good for you 24-7. Th this message is not about sticking your head in the sand and not, what's, and not know what's going on in the world. It is to say, what are you spending the most time bringing in to your mind that's going to live in your thoughts? And a news cycle is going to give you 57 minutes of bad news and two and a half minutes of a cat being saved from a tree by a fire truck. Well, not the fire truck itself, I'm a literist. The fireman, right? If the truck does it, that's a transformer and that's a completely different message. <laughs> Sorry, the literalist in me was like, fix it, Tim. <laughs> what are you thinking about? Is it pure? Is it beautiful? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Or is it toxic? Divisive? I was on the plane with a woman uh, yesterday, 79 years old, from Tennessee. She was missing like six teeth. And she was so sweet. We talked for about, well, she talked. In our 50 minute conversation, she talked 47 minutes. And I learned so much from that woman. Five foot two, married three times, 
left two domestically violent relationships and found out a way to still enjoy her life, love her kids, her grandkids, and her great-grandkids. We bonded on things, and I learned so much from that woman. From Tennessee, the only thing that brought us together was a seat on a plane. There is nothing that this 79-year-old woman from Tennessee and this boy who is 47 from Inglewood really have in common, except when your mind is open to just engage with a person instead of judging that person, stereotyping that person, having preconceived ideas about that person, you get to just enjoy life in a completely different way. But we have believers. I'm not talking about people in the world. I'm talking about we have believers whose minds have been polluted so much by outside culture that you can't even love your brother and your sister the way that we should without having a preconceived judgment about them. Fix your thoughts. Paul goes on to say, uh, I want you to think about things and fix your thoughts on things that are excellent. It's one of my favorites, and um, I'm going to stir the pot a little bit on this one as well. I love excellent things. I, lo- I'm, I-, I survived the hood. So I'm really bougie, okay? I have not been on missions trips and stuff like that. Surviving the hood is a missions trip, so I don't, I pay for people to go on missions trip. I don't go, I'm like, you're about to go rough it in Cambodia? Here's money. I'm praying for y'all. I survived my mission trip. It was the hood. Okay, so I love excellent things. I, I, I'm inspired by, by, by painters and artists that are excellent, musicians that are great at their craft. I'm, I'm inspired every time. We are big fans of the Summer Olympics. So, so, so when Michael Phelps won all of those gold medals uh, uh, for swimming, it made me want to dive in a pool. You just get inspired. You're like, I'm going to swim too. Not as fast or win anything notably, but yay. Usain Bolt wins nine gold medals over three Olympics. Do you know how much excellence you have to have for how long to win nine medals across three different Olympics? That's the span of 12 years. The conditioning of the body, the mental fortitude you have to have to be determined every year. It's one thing to win, but to win again and then again, that's excellent. Now I want to sprint. When I eat great food, it makes me want to cook. I can't, but it makes me want to. I love things that are excellent. We, we, we are inspired when things are excellent. We are uplifted when things are excellent. Here's what I don't like. I do not like when we, are believer, we as believers are told to accept things that are mediocre just because we believe in Jesus. No, I want to think about things that are excellent. So make sure that what you're giving me is excellent. I don't care if it's a Christian business. If you're late with your product, you're not excellent. I don't care if it's praise and worship. If you don't know how to play the guitar, don't play the guitar. (laughs) Technology exists where we can get the track to play until you finish your lessons. If you can't sing, don't make a joyful noise with the hot mic. That is not excellent. If you can't get a download from heaven for a sermon, don't Google one online. I want fresh bread, not croutons. Is it excellent? Is it good? Because that's what inspires us. When you you see somebody that has taken time to make something just right, it inspires us all. These are the songs that we sing about God because he is excellent. But do you know that everything that God called that he created, he just called it good. 
We say it's majestic to behold and we take it all in and we're like, oh my goodness, I am just completely overwhelmed by the beautiful creation that is uh, downloaded from heaven. And God's like, it's good. Those mountains, good. Snow-capped mountains, good. That horse, it's good. Crocodile, good. Roach, I don't know how he called that good, but whatever. There's an ecosystem I don't know about. If I see him, I'm spraying him, but whatever. <laughs> Think about things that are excellent. Focus your mind on things that inspire you to be great. Don't rehash stuff that's already bad. Don't bring up a lot of stuff that's bad. Hear me, if it's consuming your mind, it will make you go blind to the beauty of what God has in creation. And lastly, Paul says, fix your thoughts on things that are worthy of praise. I love this one. Fix your thoughts on things that are worthy of praise. My most simplistic way to make this happen is simply to fix your mind and ask yourself, what is worthy of telling other people about? That's when something's worthy of praise. You want to tell others about it. I want us as believers to be people that are fixing our thoughts on things that are worthy of praise and sharing those things that are actually worthy of praise. Not the stuff that's not worthy of praise. Not, not the stuff in culture that is so crazy. I don't care how many times the Kardashians have collectively been divorced. That's not even worthy of praise. Again, culture is, we're under like a Niagara Fall of information. We get to choose what we fix our thoughts on. We don't get the choice sometimes to know what's coming at us. But we get the choice to pluck down and fix our thoughts and go, I'm going to think about this some more. I don't want to think about things that are not worthy of praise. I want to share stuff that's amazing. I want people to know stuff that's good. I have, I, I call myself an, op, uh, uh, an optimistic realist. This is what happens when you live long enough. When I was in my 20s, I was a pure optimist. Late 30s, I'm like, I need to tweak this a bit. I've lived in the, I lived enough life to know uh, everything ain't gonna go right. And you could be the most optimistic person in the world, but reality hits and you're gonna figure out, you know what? I believe the best for you, but you don't. Your fault. That's on you. There's nothing I can do about it. And I have to let that go. As altruistic as I am, I have to realize that I cannot override somebody's free will. And if God won't do it, I can't either. So I can pray and I can ask God, but I cannot be at your feet begging you to be somebody that you don't want to be. But I do want to share what's worthy of praise. This is why I share the gospel. This is why I talk about my kids. This is why I talk about my fine wife. That girl fine, too. She fine. She fine, fine. She keeps getting finer. It's weird. It's worthy of praise. The chicken wings I had last night. Not just the chicken wings, but that particular barbecue sauce that had bourbon in it. That's worthy of praise. I want to share that with you. I want you to know about that. I want you to have those wings. I want you to taste that sauce. And I want you to be as blessed as I did. It's at that Hilton that they kept me in. Y'all go over there. Tell them Tim sent you. It's worthy of praise. I don't want to tell you about some bad preacher's bad sermon. Why would I want to tell you that? It's not worthy of praise. Why would I want you to know it? I didn't like it. Why would I tell you? I don't want to tell you about Somebody who's fallen morally, especially if you don't know them, that's not worthy of praise. Why would we do that? 
In the same way, if you fix your thoughts, you will literally not be so overwhelmed by the issues of life. May I remind you that a man that wrote this was behind prison walls, putting pen to parchment, letting the Philippians know who were persecuted that they could have joy. What's our excuse? If you were to walk up to the average Philippian who read Paul's letter being persecuted in their day and say, how's it going? Woo! It is so good. But you're being persecuted. Nah, yeah, we are, but we've prayed about that. And our minds are at peace. And we fix our thoughts on things that are true. And the truth is that even in persecution, our God is still faithful. He never promised us that a relationship with Jesus would exempt us from life. He did promise that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. See, when you have an anchor rooted in what Christ says about you and what God says is true about your life, it doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in. Bad doctor's report, you're like, God is still good. I'll never forget my... My, my cousin Cookie, I called her my aunt because she was so much older than me. But my cousin Cookie was uh, diagnosed with uh, breast cancer and she had to have a double, a double mastectomy. She had a double mastectomy. They got all the uh, cancer out. It went into remission. A few years later, it came back. When it came back, the whole family was devastated and they were supposed to do more surgeries. And uh, when they sat with the oncologist and they started walking through um, all of the treatment plans, Cookie had a very light and airy voice. She talked like this all the time. This was just her voice. And she was sitting there with the doctor, and the doctor was like, hey, uh, we could probably do this surgery, this surgery. And she goes, are you going to get it all? And they said, well, no, the way it spread, this surgery would just make you a little bit more comfortable. And she goes, I'm not gonna let you cut on me again if you're not gonna get it all. And the family was like, you have to have the surgery. We love you, you gotta stay real. You got to have the surgery. And she goes, I don't see what the big deal is. She was like, I'm in a win-win situation. If God heals me, amen. And if I die, I'm gonna be with him. So, amen. I don't see what y'all crying about. Listen, this is a woman whose thoughts were fixed on what the truth was. It is not the doctor's report. This woman's mind was fixed on what is honorable and right, what is pure, lovely, admirable. Excellent and worthy of praise. So fix your thoughts. Would you do that with me? I know it's kind of corny, but just fix your thoughts. Again. One more time. Now, some of y'all think that, like basketball, that this is a Carmelo Anthony tribute, but it's not. Eight people got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> this week, if what I call an invading thought pops into your mind, just as a reminder, just mm. for some of us, you might have some things in your mind that you might be like this. <laughs> <sighs> I'm telling you, there is a war going on for what we think about. What we think about, we either put words to or actions to. The right things will bring out the right words and the right actions. The wrong things 
can bring out the wrong words and the wrong actions. And so it's imperative that we fix our thoughts. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? I can testify that, they, that I've had a lot of thoughts that I've needed fixed. Well, actually, I've had a lot of thoughts that I needed kicked out of my mind <laughs> before they could be replaced with the thoughts that needed to be fixed. And it's just a sweet reminder that God truly wants you to be at peace in your mind. Not riddled with worry, fear, rage. But at peace because you know who the truth is. So God, thank you for my brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters. I pray that this message would fix our thoughts so that our minds will be at peace. In Jesus' name, amen.